My name is Dean Verando and I'm the lead systems engineer here in EMEA, primarily focusing on both the ICS and DAC verticals, working alongside Florent. Thank you again for joining this portion of the webcast entitled Can't Patch, What Else? The main topic for this webcast was based on actual customer conversations both Florent and myself have had with both our IT and OT customer base. However, this can't patch mentality is admittedly a lot more pertinent to the OT world. So let's find out why. This is just a quick look at the agenda and what I am planning on covering over my portion of the webinar. So firstly, why patch? What are the actual benefits and risks? Then we'll look at talking a little bit about IT versus OT and what is the actual difference between the two. Followed by con patch, what recommendations can we offer to help in this regard? Then, obviously, how helpful is it to provide recommendations without backing them up with solutions that can actually help? That'll lead us to how Tripwire will help. Lastly, I'll provide some contact details and some resourceful links. So, why patch? What is the point? Is patching actually worth the effort? Here is a list of both pros to patching as well as potential cons or risks to not patching. Usually organizations only think of patching as a fix to the security flaws in either OSs or applications. However, that should not be the only benefit you can gain from patching correctly. A lot of vendors do release patches that not only fix security flaws as expected, but also roll those patches out with application stability improvements as well. These improvements could actually provide a strong case in the ICS world, as stability and uptime of devices is one of the most cr uh, critical focal points. Lastly, patches can also assist in resolving specific bugs or flaws in certain applications, which again can strengthen the business case as to why organizations should patch. However, with all the pros and benefits we've just spoken about, there are equally negative or risky reasons to not patch. Usually, Within the IT side of the organization, the benefits outweigh the risks as loss of data is considered a bigger concern than downtime of a network. Whereas within the OT side of the business, uptime is key. How the two sides of the organization view risk versus reward are vastly different, and I'll hopefully cover that in more detail in the next slide. Some of the main risks of patching are things such as potentially taking down a network um, or devices with a malformed or corrupt patch. Also, patching can be considered very time consuming, and in some cases a full-time job. There are said to be over 15 new vulnerabilities discovered every day. Now let's think about the risk or the impact of cost. Depending on which side of the organization you are sitting on, so either RT or OT, you could have different cost factors. Hopefully, both sides of the organization would have test or development labs that all patches could be tested against before rolling out on production systems. But if you think about the actual cost logistics, OT organizations would have to set up actual hardware that mimics the real production systems. Unlike the IT world, where they would also mimic the production world, but they could have tools that simplify the process, such as a virtual estate. IT could also roll out automated patch management solutions that could vastly reduce the number of staff and man hours required to test all those patches. OT, on the other hand, would I guess in most cases, not, not all the time, but have to test the patches on each individual device and most probably rely on the vendor specialist to actually deliver the updates themselves. Thus incurring a much higher cost to benefit ratio than in the RT side. Last thing to think about is vendor end of life product cycles or EOL. Again, this is not as much of a risk in the IT side of the organization. Testing, Upgrading of OSs, for example, in, in, and in most cases, a lot easier with the, use of, with the use of newer solutions, such as virtual environments I've already mentioned. Couple that with the reduced concern on uptime, not saying that the IT don't worry about it, does make EOL solutions a lot easier to deal with within IT, and so it can be considered a lower risk. However, in OT, this is vastly different. Some OT production systems have been around for over 20 to 30 years and a lot longer in such cases. As such, most of them have probably never been upgraded or patched. So asking them to take a risk of patching systems that have been working flawlessly for decades for a benefit of making it harder to possibly be hacked is a hard thing to do. The old adage of it's not if you get hacked, but when you get hacked is helping uh, to highlight the risk of not doing anything. 
OT organizations do still strongly believe that it can't or won't happen to them. The risk associated with when we get hacked should be looked at in detail and weighed up against the probability of a full system shutdown as opposed to doing a controlled manual segmented patch. Now in the previous slide, I spoke about why it's worth patching overall and briefly touched on the notion of IT versus OT and how they differ. Let's look into that a little bit deeper. So, as I've already mentioned, IT and OT both have to, or at least should, patch as often as possible. But I've also covered that their risks or concerns are prioritized differently. As you can see on the left, the IT side of the organization has three main concerns. First, and usually the highest priority, is confidentiality. Losing something such as customer or even staff personal details could be catastrophic to any organization. Following that, the second area of highest concern for IT would be integrity. Both branding and customer retention could be massively affected to any organization having to admit that they have been breached and any data or intellectual property has been stolen. Something like this could result in large financial losses for the organization and they could face problems such as fines or even loss of business as usual revenue from unhappy customers or prospects. Lastly, and again, this is still a concern for the IT side of the organization, is availability. Like I mentioned in my previous slides, IT do and would like to maintain system availability at all times and especially on systems that are customer facing. However, should a system go down, usually the impact and the mean time to repair is a lot shorter than within OT organizations. Rebuilding a system from let's say a virtual backup or a template is a lot simpler than having to get a physical device removed off the production floor and replaced with a new one. That's not even catering for the fact that a lot of OT side of the organizations rely on a lot of the vendor specialists to actually carry out that swap, thus increasing the cost and the mean time to repair. Now, let's see how the OT side of the organization see the same risks. First thing you'll notice is availability is the highest priority. This is completely understandable as the cost associated with a downtime, even a short downtime, could result in millions of pounds worth of losses. A good example could be something like a smelting plant, where an iron ore smelter could take hours if not days to warm up. Assuming a, day, a downtime did occur and the smelter managed to cool down, organizations could potentially have a warehouse full of staff not able to work. They could have missed SLAs with their costs associated, they could have a backlog of other production entities waiting for the actual iron itself. Just use your imagination of the potential impact should a national infrastructure go down for even a couple of hours. Second on the list is integrity, and OT would generally see integrity within the same bracket as IT, so branding, loss of revenue, etc. would also apply. And lastly, confidentiality. Now this should not be seen as a minimal concern, as the loss of intellectual property from an OT organization could have very large consequences. Think something along the lines of hackers being able to steal government top secret plans, or even something like an OT side of a commercial organization losing their secret source, if you will, such as a, a syrup recipe to a world famous beverages company. Imagine if one of their rivals managed to get their hands on that. With that being said, IT and OT do share common ground, and that is safety. Now that we have covered why and how the IT and OT side of the organization might see things differently, let's look at how different they actually are. This rainbow graph is a very nice illustration of what systems and solutions are specific to each side of the organization. And also, I guess more importantly, where they overlap. Usually, both IT and OT are surprised at how many points do actually overlap. As you can see, asset discovery, vulnerability assessment, policy management, change detection, configuration assessment, and log management are all, or hopefully at least should be, present within both sides of the organization, and only the IT side having a keen focus on reporting and analytics, as well as a centralized operations team to manage the flow of alert data. Obviously, the OT side have a need for industrial control systems such as SCADA and factory automation. Now, hopefully most of us will have heard recently about the market shift for organizations to start converging both IT and OT, and essentially have both entities reporting under one technical umbrella. This has its own pros and cons, but with the overlap graph we've just discussed, this might be a lot simpler than most people are anticipating. As an example, imagine the benefit our OT could receive 
by sending all their device logs to an IT historian-like tool known as an SIM or a SIM tool in order to monitor and analyze the OT data. Rather than sending the logs to their local historian, which would never get looked at, IT already have the centralized operations team and the tools in place to be able to quickly identify potential malicious patterns of interest. Should an alert be raised, IT could then feed this back to the OT team to investigate. OT could then deal with a single event rather than having to hire a team to dig through the proverbial noise themselves thus reducing the headcount and associated costs. Now, as a lot of you already know, Tropi was acquired by a parent company called Belden, a little over three years ago. The acquisition was based on the Belden customer need to secure the industrial estates. Every day, there are more and more stories in the news about industrial organizations being hacked and the rate of news articles and reports are rapidly accelerating on a daily basis. OT organizations are now starting to realize that physical security, although important, is not the security it once was. The more devices that are becoming IP-based and are being connected to wider networks, the more the threat landscape is opening up, meaning that OT needs to start thinking more along the lines of IT security in a way and how to protect internally as well as external. Having heard their customers' concerns and seeing the potential threat hitting their customer base, Belden released a new approach to industrial security. Belden released a methodology called Belden's 123 approach, and essentially, it helps their customers focus on what's the most important areas to address when it comes to cybersecurity. Simply put, where they should start focusing first. Number one, focus on the network mainly and talks about things such as segmentation and zoning to certain threats that might find their way into the environment. It also refers to monitoring and alerting on activities within the estate that could flag up potential threats. Number two, talks about securing the endpoints, being able to determine what devices you actually have in your environment, their potential vulnerabilities, as well as detect any changes taking place on those devices. These changes should also be analyzed to determine if there are business as usual changes or potentially malicious. And finally, number three. Number three talks about assessing industrial controllers for vulnerabilities and changes. And again, being able to ascertain whether a change is authorized or unauthorized. So, with all that being said, we should hopefully now be in a better place to understand why there would be a need to avoid patching in certain circumstances. And this brings us to the meat of the actual presentation. What else can be done if you can't patch? Those of you that know me know that I like to use metaphors a lot. I like to try to explain my use cases and understandings against everyday scenes and scenarios. With that being said, let me explain what I believe most ICS organizations should be doing as a bare minimum should they not be in a place to patch. There are six key areas that I want to highlight. Hopefully, most of these areas should be familiar to most of you. The house metaphor I'm about to use should highlight these areas and hopefully help anyone that might not be that comfortable or familiar with what needs to be done or at least highlight the differences between solutions and how they help. Okay, let's begin. As you can see, we have a house with a fence. Let's assume that the whole property is an ICS network that we, sh we are looking at securing. The first recommendation would be, to, would be asset analysis or discovery. Know what you have in your environment in order to protect it. If I had to ask you what items or assets in this case do you see in the picture, what would you see? I would highlight items like the fence, the house, the tree. You could even go as far as the minor items such as grass, etc. But let's keep this nice and basic for now. The security question you should be asking yourself is, do I actually need all these devices in my estate? Why try and fix or secure items that are not actually required? Next thing I would recommend is perimeter protection. Firewalls are a good example of perimeter protection. Again, looking at a house, what would you see as a perimeter protection? At least the item in the picture. I see the fence and even perhaps the front door. Third item is segmentation. I've already discussed the benefits of segmentation and so would then say that in this metaphor, segmentation could be things such as the front lawn, the room on the left, the room in the middle and potentially the room on the right, all which could be divided by a security door. 
Next is log management. Now, often I get asked if log management can be used as an IDS tool or to detect changes in the states and essentially become the single tool of choice that can monitor all, and this is definitely not the case. Log management is a tool that is designed to look for movement within the estates or devices. So I guess back to our metaphor, this would be like capturing someone opening the front gate, walking to the front door and trying to open it. Finding that it's actually locked, potentially also detecting that the proverbial thief has tried to push the door down. Try to bang on it very hard a few times and potentially try to kick it down as well with no success. That brings us to vulnerability assessment. This would be the equivalent of looking at the house from the street and trying to determine where all the potential weak points are. For example, a fence with gaps between the slats could be a potential weak point. The glass in the windows could be left open or even broken very easily or perhaps the loft window at the top of the room could be left unlocked assuming that nobody can reach up there so there's no point locking it. And lastly, and in my opinion, one of the most important areas is FIM or file integrity monitoring. This area is crucial to be able to monitor actual changes taking place within a metaphorical house. All the areas we have already mentioned predominantly cover external monitoring and do not really cater for scenarios where the hacker or malware are already inside the house. Now with that being said, there are areas where tools such as log management can be used to track movement within the house. However, they are not able to detect any actual changes in great detail. In our example, let's assume we have taken a snapshot of all the content within each segmented room. Should a thief decide to walk or move around the room without touching anything, you would not be able to tell exactly what his intentions were. You could try and predict what he's thinking of doing based on, on his movements alone. However, once a thief decides to steal, remove or alter any aspect of the room, having a tool that acts like a real-time like CCTV camera is critical. As we know, in order for any malicious activity to take place, something has to change. It could be something as small as some books being removed off a shelf to large changes like the TV and the picture on the wall being removed. Without being in a place to do a before and after comparison at all times, and ideally in real time, you would struggle to forensically show critical security information such as who, what, when, etc. Not only do you need to be able to detect changes to existing infrastructure, but you should also be able to detect any items left behind they could be used to spoof or watch legitimate users entering the room. Watching and capturing things like credentials being written down during their visit to the room, seen here as a newly installed camera, could be quite a bad thing. Now that we've covered six of our most recommended areas of focus, let's quickly talk about how Tripwire can help, as well as talk through a real world example. Tripwire's portfolio consists of best of breed solutions. They can either work together or be used as standalone solutions offering customers maximum flexibility in deployment. As I've already stated, file integrity monitoring or FIM is in my opinion one of the most important areas to cover. Tripwire Enterprise, shown here in blue on the left, is our file integrity and configuration assessment solution. This tool is able to identify and alert on all changes that take place within an organization's IP network. Proving detailed change information, such as who made the change, when the change happened, and also what the actual change was by providing a side-by-side -side comparison report. Next product to quickly talk about is Tripwire RP360, shown here on the right in green. Tripwire RP360 is a vulnerability solution that not only has the functionality to discover assets on, on, on the network, but to also scan them against known vulnerability database of over 130,000 unique tests. RB360 is also unique in a way that is able to prioritize the highest risk vulnerabilities first with its own scoring algorithm. This method of prioritization is very powerful as it helps reduce the number of vulnerabilities an organization should focus on. And last, but by no means least, all organizations should have some form of log management solution or SIM tool, seen here in purple at the bottom. Tripwire Log Center could be classed, I guess, as a smart historian, if you, if you will, within the RT world. Having all three solutions that Tripwire offer integrated 
would provide not only the security measure recommended as an absolute minimum, but also provide processes that could reduce the amount of data required to sift through in order to detect potential threats. Now that you're hopefully more familiar with the Tripwire product portfolio and have a focal point on at least six areas that would recommend monitoring, we thought it'd be a good idea to point out where Tripwire can help against a well-known Purdue model. Tripwire has a lot of coverage in the level three to level five zones. Being able to monitor most of the devices within those networks is what we have been doing for 20 plus years. The interesting point is how Tripwire is able to assist with level two, and in some cases, level one and level zero. Now, at most ICS customers do err on the side of caution when it comes to vendors being able to actually touch the industrial controllers, such as a PLC. Tripwire decides to provide the functionality to be able to monitor certain files and configurations via the middleware layer, such as industrial high vision or alternate middleware solutions such as Rockwell's Asset Center, as an example. This approach does remove the risk of potentially affecting the availability of the controllers which, as we now know, is number one on the ICS highest priority risk. With that being said, Tripwire is able to monitor non-OS-based devices, such as network devices, and in this case, could provide the option to connect to the endpoint devices directly, if required, and if there is no middleware solution available. Now, let's look at a real-world example that is common in a lot of ICS environments, Windows XP. Windows XP is still commonly be used as the base OS to a lot of HMI still in production today. So let's quickly cover what we know about XP and its security posture. First, as we all know, Microsoft have ERL'd or end of life XP back in 2014. That's over four years of no security patch updates being released. Very scary when you think about the statistic that I mentioned earlier of over 15 new vulnerabilities being discovered daily. Secondly, a newly installed version of XP scanned for vulnerabilities will show up over 721 known vulnerabilities. And lastly, Microsoft have officially released three service packs, which do address most of the vulnerabilities, but not all of them. Having that many vulnerabilities to deal with is potentially a huge risk, as well as a daunting task to address if organizations are not able to patch. This brings us to the meat of the webinar itself. What can an organization do if they are not able to patch? If you consider all the areas we have discussed over the course of the webinar, then by just addressing the six areas already mentioned, that should be enough to obtain full visibility of your organization's risk posture. It's then just a case of creating a process that adopts the following recommendations. Number one, do a vulnerability scan. Number two, prioritize the vulnerabilities based on their risk score and not on the default industry scores such as a CVSS score. The reason for this is due to the fact that a lot of vulnerabilities that exist on a Windows XP OS would most probably be reflected as a high in a low medium high rating or as a 5 in a 1 to 5 or as a 10 in the CVSS scoring rating. The problem with this is that you will most probably find that most of the 721 known vulnerabilities would fall within this category using a unique scoring algorithm provided in tools such as IP360 will highlight the highest impact vulnerabilities first, and as such, reduce the amount of vulnerabilities you would have to deal with on a manual basis. Number three, and most probably the most important with regard to this webcast, is to try and fix the highest rated vulnerabilities manually. Most of the time, organizations do not realize that you can reduce the risk posture of most systems with a simple step-by-step -step process. Vulnerabilities such as a default account credential still being in place or guest account still being enabled are usually simple fixes that can be done with minimal risk to the availability of the device. Again, the key is to have a solution that can filter out the highest risks from the noise. Now, getting the system secured or hardened is only half the battle. Step four to step six should be done in order to make sure that an unpatched system is not being compromised whilst not being patched. Monitoring critical OS files and elements, such as registries, services, open ports, and user groups with the best of breed firm solution is vital. As organizations are not able to rely on vendor patches to close the security holes, monitoring all activities becomes essential. Going back to our metaphor earlier, imagine your house did not have any locks on the windows when it was built. 
assuming locks get installed with patches, etc. Watching the windows in minute detail and making sure that they do not change from a state of closed to open is the only way to confirm that that particular vulnerability is either being exploited or not. As I've already mentioned, no malicious activity can take place without some form of change taking place as well. Now, in our example, we are talking about Windows XP and we do know that there is a lot of potential weak points. But one area we have not discussed is the third-party applications installed on the OS itself. This brings us to the next step. Organizations need to make sure they are able to monitor all the files and folders of those third-party applications. Any exploits being run against those applications will leave a trail of some sort that will be detected with a FIM tool of choice. Ideally, being able to report on those changes in real time would provide organizations with additional confidence that nothing malicious is taking place between scans or even maintenance windows. And finally, being able to tie as many security solutions together is critical to reducing the amount of noise or false positives alerts that are being raised. Consider this scenario. You have a security tool that can discover assets, can scan and prioritize their risk posture, then based on those findings, the tool is then configured to automatically alert the firm solution of choice to track and alert on all changes discovered on those specific weak assets. The FIM tool then is configured to only feed syslog data to the log management solution of choice on assets that have been classed as high risk, perhaps due to not being patched as an example. And the log management tool is then configured to look for certain pattern matches such as the common five failed login attempts followed by a successful login, followed by a detection, uh, detected change of a user being added to an admin group of the local OS. These three events could raise an alert and then, for example, be fed to a staff member on the production floor to investigate immediately. So rather than trying to fix all potential threats by patching, the scenario, the scenario I've just explained could be used to watch assess a lot closer and alert if something or someone is trying to cause harm. And finally, I would just like to share some contact information for any follow-up questions. This slide does contain a short abstract of what Tripwire does, and in the interest of time, I'm not going to read it all out. However, if any of the information I've just shared with you is something that you would like to look into a bit further, or if you have any other questions, please feel free to reach out to myself, Florent, or in fact any member of the Tripwire team. Alternatively, please visit our website at www.tripwire.com, where you will find a list of resources that are available to download. Another point to mention is that Tripwire are very active on social media, and as such are always releasing new blogs, Twitter feeds, and even LinkedIn posts to try and keep everyone informed on what we are seeing on a daily basis. If you are currently subscribed to any of these social media platforms, please take the time to subscribe to some of our social media streams as well, as this is a great way we try and help our customers keep ahead of the security game. I just want to thank you for making it this far, and hopefully you have found this webinar useful. From myself and the team here at Tripwire, thank you again, and goodbye.